Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The beginning of the Gospels, the beginning of the New Testament, just barely to the right side of the middle of the Bible. Today we'll be looking at verses 33 through 37. But let us seek the Lord in his wisdom as we need it this morning to understand this tricky passage. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your mercy and your grace in revealing to us your Son through your word. We thank you for you have sent him to accomplish all your will. And Lord, we ask this morning that you would remove all and any distractions, that we would come to you in truth and honesty and repentance and faith. Lord, bring faith where there is none. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin, I want to ask a couple questions about our experiences. I wonder, have you ever made a promise to someone or someone else that you didn't really fully intend to keep? Weren't sure if you could keep it or you just flat out didn't want to. And as you did so, did you feel any remorse for that or perhaps looking back on it in the past? And I also wonder, were there any consequences for it? Now, let's turn that thought around and ask ourselves, what about other people? Have we been the recipients of someone telling us a promise that they didn't keep? And when they didn't, were we saddened, offended, or maybe even angered by it? And did we lose their trust in them when we found out they didn't really have the intent to keep it? In any of those cases, or in all of them, how did we respond? Did we treat others the way that we ourselves would want to treat them to treat us if we're guilty of those things? You see, Jesus' words this morning in Matthew 5, 33-37, addresses these kinds of thorny issues of the heart. But our Lord brings refreshing grace and aid to us through this text because he addresses us through two major points in this sermon. The first I want you to see is the folly of and our oaths, the folly in our oaths, and secondly, the wisdom in God's oath. The wisdom in God's oath. So, let's begin looking at our text this morning in Matthew 5.33. Jesus says, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Our Lord Jesus introduces yet another crucial topic by some familiar words when he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old. You see, these words reveal a kind of pattern that Jesus uses throughout his sermon. You see in verse 21 that he uses a familiar phrase, you have heard that it was said to those of old. But if you look at verses 27, 31, 33, 38, and 43, you don't see the exact same language, but very similar language. But what is Jesus doing here when he does that? He's not randomly shifting from topic to topic or just addressing matters on a whim, as we might be tempted to think. You know, Jesus does something very deliberate in his sermon. He addresses, in each of these sections, parts of the moral law. He recites parts of the moral law to his audience, and then he points to an example in his day of how it was abused, how it was misused. And today's text, as I already alluded to, is no different. Let's take a closer look again at verse 33. He says, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. You may see in your Bibles a quotation around those words. But if you do some searching, you'll notice that it's not a direct quotation of any single commandment in the scriptures. You see, Jesus paraphrases three separate passages from the Old Testament. He paraphrases Leviticus 19.12, which says, You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. He also paraphrases Numbers 30, verse 2, which says, 
If a man makes a vow to Yahweh or swears an oath to bind himself with an obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do all that proceeds out of his mouth. And finally, from Deuteronomy 21, 23, 21, he says, When you make a vow to Yahweh your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for Yahweh your God will surely require it of you. I wonder, as we listen to those words, do we hear any echoes, any maybe reverberations of the Ten Commandments? Perhaps, you shall not bear false witness comes to mind. It's the Ninth Commandment. Or, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, the Third Commandment. In all these commandments, all ten rest on the fact that God is the only true God, which begins this law by saying, you shall have no other gods before me. That's in his presence. So our Lord Jesus wisely summarizes the commands of the law with the words in verse 33 when he says, you shall not swear falsely by my name, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But what kind of swearing is Jesus referring to? And why is it such a problem, or appear to be? You see, when the Bible talks about swearing in this context, which Jesus brings up, he's not speaking of the foul or crude language that we might typically associate in our experience. That kind of swearing is, of course, as we even saw partially mentioned in Ecclesiastes, it's prohibited by God's word. Another instance we see of this is when Paul exhorts the Ephesians to be imitators of God, he says, but sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be made among you as is proper among the saints, nor filthiness, foolish talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting. But in this text, Jesus is concerned with the swearing of oaths. Now I know oaths are not common use in our language, everyday language, are they? So let's ask another question. What is this kind of an oath? Here's a simple definition I hope will help us today. An oath is simply when we call upon a witness to confirm the truthfulness of what we say. Jesus illustrates the problem of swearing oaths in our text this morning in verses 34 through 36. And I want us to take a bird's eye view of those verses. Notice the different things he says not to swear by. Do you see in verse 34 when he says, by heaven, or verse 35, by earth, or Jerusalem, or at the end, by your head? Now, for us, it may not be immediately obvious why, it's not, why we should not take an oath by the earth, or by heaven, or by Jerusalem, or by our head. This is where understanding something about Jewish tradition helps us. You see... If a rabbi or another teacher wanted to prove their point on some particular matter that God's word just didn't really clearly address, they'd call upon the words of someone respected, someone well-known in their circles as a kind of witness, a testimony. And these quotations would come from a collection of commentaries that had accumulated over time. And these expansive interpretations became more and more authoritative as time went on. And especially we see that amongst the Pharisees. So why does you knowing that help us understand our passage this morning? Because what our Lord Jesus does here in our passage is he references, he's citing portions of that tradition called the Mishnah in our passage. You see, instead of swearing by God's name, people would make promises or oaths by swearing by something else, something lesser than God. Something like heaven, earth, or the altar in Jerusalem, or even one's own life, which is really what we mean by swearing by your head. This trivialized the concept of oaths, and it rendered them basically meaningless and useless. You see, the Pharisees held, a narrow, held to the narrow letter of the law itself, but they didn't really capture both the letter and the spirit. This limited understanding led them to think that they were upholding the very law itself even when they broke the oath that they made because they didn't swear by the strict words of God's name. But in reality, it was altogether different. Jesus says that they did break the law. 
because he says, you shall not swear falsely. And then they fail to perform what they swore. They have sworn in the presence of God, even if it was in his name. And last week, we saw a clear illustration of this very reality, this understanding of O's, when we looked at Matthew 5, 31 through 32, on the topic of divorce. You see, remember that men were divorcing their wives over seemingly trivial matters, because they had their sort of fingers crossed behind their back when they were taking their vows. In some traditions, teachers argued that men could nullify their marital vows because of some kind of fault that they found in their wives. And this fault was often interpreted broadly or very generously to suit their own circumstances. So a man would enter marriage without any real concern for keeping his word, for keeping the oath that he swore. And this kind of a softening of God's law missed the heart that God had behind it, but it also hurt others in the process. Jesus isn't replacing law here. Instead, Jesus is upholding and strengthening the law. As we've seen, as we've seen throughout Matthew 5, we've seen that Jesus corrects this kind of misunderstanding and twisting of the scriptures. But we should ask ourselves, By what kind of authority does he do this? Does he quote yet another rabbi or the tradition to support his claims? Let's look at verses 34 to 36 to find out as we see God's wisdom. He says, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Jesus opens up his response by saying, But I, I say to you. You see, these are not the words of a typical teacher or rabbi of the day. What Jesus does here is that he stands on his own authority, his own authority as the Lord of the covenant, And he then goes on to correct the common abuse of oaths by saying in verse 34, do not take an oath at all. In context, this word, this language, do not take an oath at all, we can understand it in two different ways. The one fairly obvious way that we can understand it is that Jesus is making a very broad statement. He's just banning all oaths at all time for whatever reason. Just don't do it. And perhaps you might have read James recently or sometime, and some of these words may ring in your ears, because G- James says in James chapter 5, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. So, that's it, right? Both James and the Lord Jesus forbid us from making oaths. And that sells the question. Or does it? See, many sincere godly men and women have understood Jesus' words to be this kind of broad statement, this kind of broad ban on oaths. And perhaps this morning you are one of them. But I want you to see that Jesus is not issuing this kind of a ban. I'm convinced not by my own authority, but by God's word itself. In fact, There are occasions where the scripture warrants us, Christians, to make oaths and vows. Let's consider several reasons for that. Why is Jesus not issuing an absolute ban on oaths? The first reason, just the context that we're in. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. A couple weeks ago, we looked at verses 17 through 20 in this chapter where Jesus is explicitly teaching that we, he has not come to abolish the law of the prophets, and that not one jot or tittle law will pass away. In verse 33, Jesus is teaching us how to apply those first, third, and ninth commandments that we discussed to everyday life. And so to understand verse 34, to forbid all oaths of any kind whatsoever, 
is to say that Jesus is invalidating this old law and replacing it with something else. But that conclusion would actually violate and contradict what Jesus has been teaching so far. So we can't have that conclusion. The second reason are the Old Testament saints themselves. In Genesis 24, Abraham himself makes a covenant with his servant to secure a wife for his son Isaac. And when he does this, he makes an oath not to take someone from one of the Canaanites. In another instance, we see in 1 Samuel 1, a godly woman named Hannah, who's barren. And she makes a vow to the Lord that if the Lord would give her a son, that she would devote him to Lord's service. And consider the New Testament saints. The Apostle Paul, he makes an oath as well, several times actually throughout his epistles, because often his authority as an apostle is being challenged by false teachers. And in Galatians 1, 120, Romans 9, 1 through 2, and other letters as well, 2 Corinthians, Paul makes an oath to confirm the truthfulness of what he is saying. And fourthly, I want you to consider the angels. In the New Testament, in Revelation 10, 5 through 6, we see a holy angel standing, swearing an oath to confirm the truth of God's certain promises yet to come. If that's not enough, there's a fifth reason. None of these examples in the Old Testament, the New Testament, these saints or the angels themselves are condemned for making oaths in the, manner, in the way they did. But more importantly than that, God himself makes oaths. There are several instances of God taking oaths throughout Scripture, but I only need to show you one of them. Listen to what the preacher in Hebrews says to his people. He says in Hebrews chapter 6, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. You see, God demonstrated to Abraham the invincible strength of his purpose. He did so with an oath. God swore by himself, and that was more than enough to sustain Abraham and his faith. It's enough for us as well. Now with these five reasons, do you see how Jesus cannot be prohibiting all oaths whatsoever? God's word overwhelmingly teaches that oaths are not inherently evil or sinful in themselves. There is an appropriate way to make them. This leads us to the next possible, and I believe the correct and way that Jesus intends us to take his words. Let's look again at verse 34. Jesus says, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. You see, Jesus is explaining what he means by what he says, do not take an oath at all, by these kind of four parallel statements. He says, do not swear by heaven in verse 34. Because as Jesus says in this passage, and also later in Matthew 23, that whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and him who sits on the throne. You see, heaven is God's heaven. It's his domain. His throne is in the very center of it. And therefore, you can't avoid bringing God's name into the matter by swearing by heaven. He then argues not to swear by the earth in verse 35. And why should we not swear by the earth? Well, he says, because it is God's footstool. You see, earth is that lower realm of creation where God rules all things exhaustively. The scriptures describe the earth as his footstool, not because there's something wrong with the earth, but because we see by this imagery that the vastness of all of creation cannot compare with our God. And it cannot contain him. 
Jesus then argues, thirdly, that we should not swear by Jerusalem in verse 35. He says, because it is the city of the great king, that city which we know by Jerusalem is the earthly dwelling place for God. So where his presence was manifested in his holy temple. People had this practice of swearing by Jerusalem or by swearing by the altar to seem like they're devoting themselves and what these things are to God. But this is also foolishness because these things were already holy to the Lord. And finally, Jesus says not to swear by your head in verse 36 because you cannot make your hair not even one strand white or black. The logic is you don't have the strength, the fortitude, to change the smallest aspect of one part of your appearance by a sheer force of will. Our hair color itself is ordained by God because we are his creatures and our lives belong to him in every way. So when Jesus says not to take an oath at all, he's forbidding all kinds of oaths through these four different things, according to these four different things. These four different things have, all thing, have something in common. None of them are objects of our worship. They're not worthy of that. And none of them are God himself. The Lord Jesus here is drawing guidelines for us for the proper and lawful use of oaths in our passage. Not forbidding them outright, but saying do not do so in this way. You may be wondering at this point, okay, we're talking about oaths. So how do we do it? Should we do it? Brothers and sisters, our scriptures are surprisingly rich and deep on this topic. And so I would encourage you sometime to do a kind of study throughout the Old Testament and New Testament to see what God's word has for us on this matter. But when you do, I think you will find five things, five essential principles to guide us. The first principle is that vows, vows are voluntary commitments that we make to God. O's, the second thing, O's confirm the truthfulness of our statements to other men. The third thing is that O's are both done in the presence in the court of heaven. You see, because they're done so before God, they are conscience acts of worship. They're not secular. They are sacred. And as worship, we can only swear by God's name alone. Because if we were to swear by any other name, like heaven, earth, Jerusalem, or our head, what we're doing is that we're, describe, we're ascribing divine attributes to those things. We're placing them in the place that God has alone. Fourthly, oaths and vows are therefore reserved for serious matters. They're not supposed to be everyday occurrences. So, you might want to think about, is someone's life at stake? We're called to the court of law, perhaps. That's valid. Or we're taking a marriage vow, also a similar serious statement. And lastly, oaths and vows are to be taken with a genuine, a genuine conscience and honest frame of heart. Therefore, we cannot take an oath if we lack the ability to perform it. And we cannot take an oath if we harbor the intent to deceive and we cannot take an oath if we do not want to follow through with it. Another pastor help, helpfully wrote on this very matter, and I think he sums it up really quite well, when he says, if you're thinking at this point that I only want to take an oath when it is absolutely necessary, you've gotten the message. That's the point. You see, by doing this, Jesus is loving the crowds. He's demonstrating God's love because He's exhorting us and his audience to not take oaths in a haphazard manner. Because if we do, James tells us that we may fall under judgment. That's why Jesus closes with our command in verse 37. Look at it with me. He says, let what you simply be say, yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. 
Jesus exhorts us to give straightforward answers. And that everyday common word answer literally means to swear back in return. I will do this if you'll do that. And straightforwardly. Because of Jesus' words here, this means that we must not equivocate in our answers. I know it's a big, big word. It is for me. But to equivocate is to give an unclear or an ambiguous answer to hide the truth. You see, the intent behind it, the heart, is to conceal. But our culture is so thoroughly permeated with this kind of equivocal language, isn't it? We can't even escape it. Entire industries are built upon it. Our modern political landscape is defined by it. I mean, we sometimes use the word politician to describe someone who's unwilling to state their words in plain, direct speech. And so often we can be vague and indirect with our words. But this, this so-called wisdom of the world, Jesus calls evil. But the wisdom of the Lord, God's wisdom, is far greater. He demands that we communicate in sincere and honest ways in every aspect of our lives. So, we may not be making oaths every day. When we take an oath, let's be honest, let's do it sincerely. But as we just realized, this impacts even just talking to one another, waking up, sharing our heart, our thoughts, or mind, or what's ever on our mind. Brothers and sisters, this topic that we've come to this morning is more important than we can ever think. I think it shows us something about the nature of our character, doesn't it? Because so often we feel an ingrained need to bolster our words with some kind of special phrase. We want it to have a punch. Sometimes we say stuff like, to be honest to qualify our language, don't we? We're holding back something and we want to say something else. We want to soften the blow a little bit, maybe. Are there times that we're reluctant to give straightforward yes or no answers to simple questions? I know, because I'm one of you, <laughs> that we've done these kinds of things from time to time. And sometimes we don't even give a thought about it doesn't even cross our minds. But what do our words reveal about us and our character? What would it look like if we took a catalog of every time that we use this kind of language to justify our actions, to justify being less than completely truthful? And no matter how we spin it, anything less than the full and honest, complete truth is by definition, a lie, isn't it? Even the smallest distortion of the truth is a gross offense in God's eyes. He is that holy. And since God is truth, he is the only standard for truth itself. So, back to the beginning. Do we promise things without considering what they cost? or if we never even intend to keep them? Do we find it easy to go back on our word? If we thought about this more and more, I think we would see the shame that should grip our hearts. I think we should understand how God views people when our fellow creatures can't even think our words hold any weight. And what's more than that? If we call the name of Jesus, if we take his name, say we profess to follow him, and yet we are known for not being trustworthy, what sorrow should move our souls when our God has kept his promises for us. 
So as uncomfortable as it is, take an honest look at yourself this morning in the light of his true word. And when we do, we'll see something of the depth of this kind of evil that Jesus talks about in our hearts. So whether we're an unbeliever or a believer this morning, this kind of a passage confronts all of us. It punches us in the face. And if we stop right now, it would be pretty sad. There would be no hope. You'd only feel the weight of God's law bearing upon you. But Jesus doesn't do that, does he? Because there is hope. There is hope for us who are liars. There is hope for us who have broken promises or been the victims of those who have broken their promises. There is hope for lawbreakers like us. Because you see, God is the one who cannot lie. And that very same God made an unbreakable promise to secure our eternal redemption. You see, the argument in Hebrews 6, I left something out. The argument in Hebrews 6, God promises to Abraham a sustained faith based on his oath in Genesis 12. But this was only a comparison to something greater. You see, this was to compare us with the oath that God makes in the New Covenant. What does God say in the New Covenant? He says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. I will make you clean. I will give you a new heart. I will sprinkle you with water. And I will put a new spirit within you, and you will be clean. And I will forgive your iniquity and your sin. I will remember no more. And so, ask yourself, are you in Christ this morning? Has he poured love for himself into your heart because he's the only one that can do it. And as we saw at the beginning of the Beatitudes, do we mourn over our sin because of God's goodness and what he's done for us? If we can't say those things are true, then don't turn away. Turn to Christ for them because he's the one that does it. Ask him to give you a new heart, an honest heart. And ask him for the ability to submit to him in repentance and faith. To turn away from our lies and our deception. And to grasp hold of his truth. And you will find him to be a sufficient and altogether merciful savior. But if we have come here this morning. And we have rejoiced in the past that God has opened our eyes to see him in truth. To see his goodness to give a renewed heart and yet we recognize our struggle. We know we're not perfect. Then I call you with along with me to rejoice in the promises that God makes to us. Because as we talked about this morning already in Sunday school, we are heirs of the promise, not by our own strength, not by our own works, but by his sheer grace. So, we, so do not let your sin, your failures, whatever you want to call them, your transgressions of his good and righteous law rob you of his mercy and his joy. That is not his design. This grace is amazing for us to grow in love for him. And so are we struggling to trust God this morning? Are we struggling to take him at his word? And does our faith seem so immeasurably small? Perhaps you're not thinking that right now, but I promise you someday you will. And when you do, whether it's now or in the future, you, I want you to look to Jesus. Just look to him. Do so by considering his character and consider his words to us in Hebrews chapter 6, the rest of which says this. After promising to Abraham, in the same way, God, 
desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, the new covenant promise, the unchangeable purpose, the unchangeableness of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So by, by two unchangeable things, which it is impossible to God, for God to lie, the oaths and his promise, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hope, the hold of the hope that is set before us. And this hope we have as an anchor for the soul. So in closing, brothers and sisters, friends, no matter what our flesh tells us, what we preach to ourselves, our Lord will never break his word. So fight the accusations of the evil one with certain, the certainty of God's promises and his gospel. The fact of the matter is he guarantees your safe passage through the hills and valleys of this life. It's not easy, but he gives us grace. So remember his word and anchor your hearts in the assurance of his oath that he made for you in blood. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious and merciful Father, thank you for your gracious promises and your word to us this morning. Lord, you are gracious to us even when we are unfaithful. Continue to renew our hearts and help us to see your faithfulness and cause us to rejoice in the hope of the glory to come. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We know that we can only ask and pray these things because of who you are. Continue to fulfill your word to us in Jesus' name. Amen.